Welcome back to Glaciers and Glacial Geomorphology. In this section of the course, we're talking about glaciers as part of a big global system. As always, there's some basic reading to get you started in the core textbook. In the last section, we talked about what the course is about and how it's organised. And we made the basic point that even though there are lots of different types of glacier, they have common characteristics and follow the same basic rules. We also made the point that glaciers are closely interconnected with a global system that controls their character and is also affected by their behaviour. Check the KLE, get onto the 12-step programme. If you have any questions, post them on the KLE discussion board. This time we're going to say more about how glaciers work within that global system. Specifically, we're going to talk about the hydrological cycle, stable isotopes, and a little bit about sediment transfer. We're moving towards the topics of mass balance and glacier motion. And once we get on to talk about glacier motion, that will open up the connections between the glaciology and glacial geomorphology parts of this module. So there's going to be an introductory presentation and then a number of follow up videos on specific topics that will give you a bit more information about things I've mentioned just here. So the basic point is that glaciers are part of a big global system. The hydrological cycle, climate, ocean currents, sea level change, plate tectonics, isostasy and eustasy, things at that kind of scale, physical geography on the mega scale, the planetary scale, are all connected to the role of glaciers and ice sheets. This image, by the way, shows a, a former Keele student gazing out over the, uh, the landscape of West Greenland. The, the glacier is just behind us uh, in, this, in this image, but the landscape in front of us is controlled by and has been, de has been developed as a, as a response to glacial processes and conditions. And just, that just illustrates the point I'm trying to make uh, in this section, that glaciers don't just live in their little spots and affect nothing outside their area. Glaciers have wide reaching impacts over time and space. In a separate video that I'll post up alongside this, I want to explore this just a little bit more in, in detail by looking at an example of the, the Yukon River in Alaska. And the point that that video illustra illustrates is how the delta, a coastal landform or a, a fluvial landform, however you want to think of it, is actually controlled very much by things happening in a glacial environment upstream of the delta. So it's a nice illustration of those connections between different parts of the geomorphic system. And that really is the main point that I want you to think about today. It's the connections between glaciers and the rest of the system. And I've put the, the, the two way arrow up there just to make the point that glaciers affect other components of the system and the system itself determines the way that glaciers uh, behave. And I'd just like you to think about developing, well, you could imagine developing your own essay plan in that blank space there and fill that in after we've talked through some of the issues in this session. My starting point for this is the argument that you can't understand the details of how glaciers behave, what they do, how, how they work, if you haven't seen the bigger picture that they are a part of. So I've just put a few pictures here for, from a glacier. Here's, here's me standing in a, in a meltwater tunnel underneath the Greenland ice sheet. Here's David Sugden looking at some micro scale landforms, striations on bedrock, bedrock again in West Greenland. And here's a close up of a tiny bit of ice cut out from a, uh, the, the front of a glacier. All of those, if you like, local uh, examples of things to do with glaciers are controlled by and connect to processes operating at the global scale. And that's what this session is trying to get you to think about, those connections between the global and the local, the macro and the micro. A very straightforward example of this, and one that I'll expand on in, in, in another little video that I'll put alongside this one, is glaciers and the hydrological cycle. There are lots of questions that you can ask to get yourself into this. Go and, go away and look up some of the answers to these. Where is all the world's water? Is it all in the oceans? Or is how, how much of it is in the oceans? How much of it is in glaciers? What about the freshwater? What proportion of the world's freshwater is stored in glaciers? And what happens as ice sheets grow and shrink and water is transferred from storage on land to storage in the ocean? How much of the planet's water is actually locked up in glaciers at different times? You'll find the answers to those questions in the, in the textbook, and I'll say a bit more about it in the, in the next video. But when you see the answers, you'll realise that glaciers are a very important component of the hydrological cycle, and that glaciers depend very much on the hydrological cycle for their position in the global system, for the things that they do, the way that they behave. 
The second case study that I want to talk about fits into that context of the hydrological cycle. And I'm going to say a few words about stable isotopes in glaciers. Now this is a really important topic in several different contexts in this module. So in this session I'm just going to introduce it very briefly and then we will return to it at different points later on in the module and gradually hopefully your, your understanding and your confidence uh, working on the isotopes uh, will, will grow as we work our way through the module. It's important in a variety of different ways. Imagine an assessment question, an essay question if you like, how are the micro scale characteristics of glaciers, the smallest scale of things in glaciers, how are they controlled by large scale systems? And I want to get into talking about isotopes by thinking about that question. Because isotopes, if, if you like, atoms within, within, within the glacier, uh, within the, the atmosphere, are the smallest scale characteristics of, of things that we're looking at in this module, but they relate to this big hydrological cycle, global atmospheric circulation um, kind of issue. I'll explain what isotopes are and how stable isotope glaciology works in, in a separate video. But at this point, I just want to make the, make the point that isotopes can tell us about a number of different things. We can use analysis of stable isotopes in, in glaciers, in glacier ice, to tell us about processes that are going on inside the glacier. We can also use them, and some of you will be doing this in, in, in other modules, to look at past climate. And we can use them also to look at the relationship between oceans, atmosphere and ice sheets. But the key point at this stage, the, the reason that I'm introducing isotopes at this point, is just to say that the stable isotope chemistry of ice in glaciers, so we're talking at the atomic level, but it's controlled by global patterns in the hydrological cycle. That's the point I'm trying to make at this stage, just the connection between scales. So if you watch the accompanying mini video, mini video on isotopes, it'll give you a bit more detail of where I'm coming from, but that's the key point different scales interact when we're looking at things to do with glaciers and the environment. You might want to come back and look again at this slide after you've seen the isotopes uh, mini lecture, but this is a summary of the key points that I'm hoping you'll take away from this, this section of the module and carry forward uh, to later sections where we talk about isotopes again. The first point there is that the separation of different versions of, of atoms of oxygen and hydrogen, that's what we call isotopic fractionation, that occurs naturally in water and in water vapour and in the atmosphere as part of the hydrological cycle. So there are differences if you take a bunch of different raindrops or snowflakes or buckets of ocean water from around the planet, there are variations from place to place and from time to time in the ratio of the different isotopes of oxygen and the ratio of the different isotopes of hydrogen or deuterium uh, in those samples. These variations that arise because of natural processes in the atmosphere and also because of some natural processes in the glacier that we'll talk about later, those variations are preserved in the snow that falls on glaciers. So the glacier ice itself preserves a long-term record of oxygen and hydrogen characteristics from the atmosphere over history. The glacier ice is a record of changes in the hydrological cycle. Those changes relate to climate change and also to changes in things going on in the glacier. So the stable isotopes give us a clue, something we can look at to reconstruct or to read things that are happening in glaciology. Have a look at that separate video that talks about the isotopes and then we'll develop that idea later on in the course. Just get, a, get your head around the basics for, for now and we'll explore it in more detail as, as we progress. So basically the point that we're, we're making here is that the hydrological cycle and the characteristics of glaciers are very much connected. If you look in more detail at the hydrological cycle and its connection with glaciers, if you look in more detail at, at stable isotopes and how they work, you will see that, that connection. And you'll see it's a connection between things operating at a global scale and things operating not just at regional or local scales, but at micro scales within glaciers. And we're going to, over the next few weeks, we're going to pull those apart a little bit and look at them in real detail detail and, and use them to understand how glaciers work, how glaciers change in response to environmental change, and how glaciers affect the landscape. Those, those are going to be the, uh, some of the key themes that we're looking at through this module. So as, as I said a moment ago, this is just a short introduction setting you up to go away and look at the other uh, few mini videos that will explore some of these issues in more detail. But this is kind of the conclusion that I'm hoping you'll, you'll be able to uh, arrive at when you've looked at those, those other videos. Glaciers are inter interconnected with other parts of the system, climate, sea level, 
atmospheric circulation. There are lots of connections there and there are lots of things for you to read that explore those connections. Central to all of that is glaciers being part of the hydrological cycle and that position within the hydrological cycle imparts physical and chemical characteristics to the ice when we look shortly at how ice is formed and how glaciers um, grow shrink and move you will see then that this is very closely tied to things that are happening in the hydrological cycle and one example of that that you'll be exploring in the accompanying video is that the micro scale the stable isotope composition the, the atomic scale composition of ice reflects big processes happening in the global system. So the thing to do now is go and look at three videos that I'm putting up alongside this one. There's a, a little exploration of uh, the Yukon River and how uh, sediment transfer along the river and into the delta is associated with, with glacial activity. There's another one about glaciers and the hydrological cycle. And there's a third one about stable isotopes in glaciology. Have a look at those three uh, mini lectures, if you like, mini videos, and that will complete this unit 2.1.